Thank you, Bill, for that fabulous introduction and for not mentioning my felony conviction, which he was threatening, too. <laughs> um, can we just start off the morning, actually, because I really love doing this? Oh, that me. <laughs> you can do it. You've had your coffee. I know you have. Yes, all right. Um, it has been a, a singular pleasure to actually hear a lot of the media, a lot of the press, a lot of reporters uh, using the word plants. It, it trips off of their tongue now, and it's, it's fabulous. We feel like we're getting a, a fair amount of attention from people who uh, tend to take plants, the green things, uh, for granted. And so um, one, one wonderful thing about uh, putting together this report is to call attention to these critical uh, things on the landscape here. So maybe I'll have this all work. That's all right. We'll just do that. So why another report? Yet another report. There are conservation organizations all over the country, all over the world, that publish uh, reports like uh, climate change and habitats, uh, the status of pollinators in North America. Undoubtedly, many of you are familiar with the State of the Birds report that comes out annually from uh, National Audubon and also Mass Audubon. Um, we feel like these reports are incredibly valuable. They put together an awful lot of useful information. But as yet, there's really been no singular study that calls attention to what is the habitat exactly, right? And plants are, in fact, the habitat, um, not to put too fine a point on it. Now, I think we're a bit plantocentric. Obviously, we are New England wildflower society. But I don't think anything uh, can exemplify this point better than looking at this sand dune. You know, this sand dune without the plants holding it together simply would not exist. And in so many ways, we would not actually exist. Um, plants are out there quietly photosynthesizing. They are drawing down all of the carbon and hot air that I'm going to emit this morning. Um, with, they, they give us the oxygen we breathe. They uh, really provide globally about $125 trillion in terms of ecosystem services throughout world worldwide. And that's each year. So they offer flood control, and they help uh, uh, control erosion. Uh, they give us fuel and fiber. You know, 75% of the top 150 pharmaceuticals that are prescribed in the United States are derived from plant compounds. So these are, these are um, very important to everyone. And yet, we tend to walk them by. How many of these children do you think are actually saying, oh, yeah, that's definitely a white birch? <laughs> I don't think so. Um, we, we really tend to, plants will sort of sink into the background. They're very well behaved. They're very quiet. They sit still. And yet our neural systems have evolved to be highly attuned to things that move, things that can chase us, things that can eat us. Um, and rather, and, and we have, of course, our ancestors have also evolved to understand which plants they can eat. Uh, but for the most part, we've lost a lot of that lore and a lot of that knowledge. And it is a common phenomenon that has been lamented in the botanical literature, plant blindness. Um, it is a syndrome that afflicts us from the time we are very small children all the way through adulthood. And we hope to, uh, by calling attention to plants and getting people out to actually appreciate them, uh, that, that we can overcome this unfortunate syndrome. Uh, there is a cure. Um, and I think that the fundamental thing to realize, and for many of our conservation organizations here, is that plants are essentially umbrella species. You, you protect uh, the plant species that hold together habitats, that are dominant in habitats, and you will protect everything else that depends upon them. Okay, plants form part of a very intricate, very often a very complex ecological web. Uh, you, if, if all you care about are the butterflies and the bunnies and the birds and the spring peepers, which if the glaciers ever actually recede, uh, we may be hearing in a couple of weeks. If that's all you care about, that's OK. But in order to uh, protect those organisms that, that really uh, we pay a lot of attention to, we need to protect the plants that they depend on. So the goals of, of our report were basically to pull together, as Debbie mentioned, we have 30 years of, of consistently collected data. But in fact, we can reach very far back uh, 
arguably a billion years. Uh, we do a fair amount of discussion in the long report of the geology, the complex geology of New England. Um, we can um, uh, also bring together, you know, data from uh, historical records, um, and and to really un synthesize what is it do we what do we know about plants? Uh, what proportion of them are rare? Uh, what do we need to worry about? And most importantly, what can we do? It's not enough to simply issue another gloom and doom report um, and have everyone roll their eyes and shrug their shoulders and say, ah, yet another thing I got to worry about. So we wanted to really suggest what, what everyone can, can do to help, uh, discuss uh, you know, some strategies for actually conserving plants. And most importantly, we want this to be part of sort of a national discussion or even an international conversation. Um, about the importance of plants and what needs to happen nationally and globally in order to protect the Earth's precious flora. So this is just the beginning. This is this sort of regional report is just the beginning of what we hope will be a much wider uh, conversation. I know it's an animal. That's, that's an animal. Don't. <laughs> How many of you just honed right in on that turtle? Right? See, that's the whole problem. I don't know why we put that on the website. Anyway, um, <clears throat> the really nice water lilies. In here. Anyway, um, so I, I hope that all of you, obviously you've all used Go Botany, so you've had to have um, uh, uh, gotten in through New England Wildflower Society. We are the oldest organization in North America dedicated to the conservation of native plants. We turn 115 years old. Uh, this year, and uh, Garden in the Woods, our flagship botanic garden, turns 50. So this is a very important birthday uh, for the society. We do a lot of conservation. We offer amazing educational programs, hundreds of courses, workshops, field trips, uh, two certificate programs, one in field botany, one in native plant horticulture and design. We do have a lovely botanic garden. It is right now under three feet of snow. But really, do come visit in July. Um, uh, we have, uh, I, I mentioned a lot of the data that we have, New England Wildflower Society founded in 1991 and is part of uh, a co collaboration. Um, we're really good at um, acronyms here. Uh, NEPCOP is the New England Plant Conservation Program and it consists of more than 60 organizations, academic institutions, uh, natural heritage programs in all six New England states. Uh, professional botanists, consulting botanists, um, who go out and monitor and manage rare plant populations. Uh, they even find new plant populations. Um, being a task force member is really fun. You get to go into swamps um, up above your knees. Um, this is a, a wonderful picture of Bill Brumbeck um, and, and others uh, discovering the uh, swamp lousewort, or rediscovering a population of the swamp lousewort. It will turn out later that Bill will not be able to get out of his hip waders uh, uh, at that day. He will need uh, extreme uh, support there. So NEPCOP is, is a tremendous uh, collaboration that brings together a, an enormous amount of expertise. We also have uh, 700 pairs of eyeballs um, on the landscape. Our plant conservation volunteer program, and I hope if you're not familiar with it, you'll actually uh, come up and, and, and talk to uh, either John Burns or, or myself or Bill Brumbeck um, afterwards. It, it consists of you know, 700 total volunteers have been trained over the course of the program. About 250 are trained every year to recognize plant species, to identify them in the field. And then they take on assignments and go out and find uh, rare plant populations, fill out field forms for our natural heritage program. So very systematically document uh, the status of those populations. And we can begin to track declines or increases in the number of plants at particular populations and also identify some of the primary threats uh, to these populations. So uh, thousands and thousands of hours of field work and vastly expanding the capacity of professional botanists uh, to, to really understand our flora. We have a very rich history of botanical collecting and botanical discovery. Um, this is simply uh, one example of this. Uh, it will uh, soon appear in uh, uh, the journal of the New England Botanical Club, Rodora, that uh, Bill mentioned. Uh, this is Merritt Lyndon Fernald, a moment of reverent silence. Please. One of the foremost botanists um, in New England um, and we, we will be publishing a paper soon that, that actually looks at some of the photographs and documentation and bot, the, uh, 
uh, herbarium specimens collected by Fernald um, in various areas in the Northeast um, and by Scott Bailey et al. Um, and they're able to go out to these sites um, 100 years later and be able to document the changes in the vegetation that have happened. That's just one example of the kinds of, of botanical documentation that we have. We obviously have herbaria um, scattered throughout New England. We have one of the world's best herbaria um, at Harvard University um, down the road. Um, but a number of years ago, Arthur Haynes, our uh, research botanist, undertook the Herbarium Recovery Project. And he visited over uh, 42 herbaria and uh, looked at more than 18,000 specimens. The man is a machine um, of, of rare plant species. These are plants uh, that are. Um, on our list um, of, of rare species and looked at all of the collections of those rare species over time, um, was able to annotate a bunch of them, uh, bring us up to date on uh, really the distribution, the historical distribution of these rare plants in New England. Um, our, our personal rock star, Arthur Haynes again, big shout out to him, also uh, published the Flora Novi Anglii in 2011, which provided a, a very important update to the flora. Um, and as well as identification keys and a whole uh, revision of a lot of the uh, taxonomic names. Botanists are constantly changing the names of plants. It's how we, it keeps us off the street. It, it's a good thing. Um, so the Flora Novi Anglii, which of course has been uh, translated effectively into our website, oh, Botany, um, where we can actually begin to update the information both in the, the Flora Novi Anglii but also distributional information in real time. So we have, uh, this is actually sort of being adopted as, as somewhat of a textbook in a number of uh, botany uh, university classes, um, both in Massachusetts and in Maine and uh, throughout the area. And students go out and actually document plants and can post them to PlantShare. Um, so we can really begin to expand um, our knowledge. We also have the Flora Conservanda. Um, and we're very good at Latin, so we have the Flora Novi Anglii, not to be confused with the Flora Conservanda, um, that was first put together by Bill Brumbeck and a, a whole, whole group of uh, expert botanists to document and look at the, all of the rare plants of New England. So what do we mean by rare? Uh, we mean that uh, they may be globally rare, that is they uh, consist of a very limited number of populations worldwide. They uh, can be regionally rare, so uh, listed in one or more New England state and in the majority of their New England range. Uh, they can be declining, so they're not necessarily uh, listed as endangered, threatened, special concern, or historic in a state, but we know that there are fewer populations uh, than there used to be. Um, and then, of course, there are the species that are historic, that no longer occur in New England. I'll come back to that. So it was first put together in 1996 and revised uh, in 2012 so that we were actually able to compare what the rare plant uh, profile in New England looked like and then 15 years later um, uh, begin to, to, to make some real comparisons and to detect which species really did appear to be declining over time. So what are, the, what are the findings of the report? That gives you a cross-section of the data that, that we've collected. Here are uh, some of the major findings. We have um, the majority of the New England, uh, does cons uh, the New England flora consists of native species, um, but we do have about a third that are non-native. And about 10% of those, or about 111 species, are regarded as invasive. So they're demonstrably outcompeting plants. They're expanding quite aggressively in New England. So that's, that's, that's comparable to other areas um, of the country. Um, and the overall number of species uh, is 3,514 as of 1045 yesterday. Um, undoubtedly, it will expand um, <coughs> and hopefully not drop. Um, and, and, and that a kind of species diversity for an area of our size is, is highly comparable to, say, the diversity of, of New York or uh, Washington State or, or Michigan, areas of, of similar area, but made all the more impressive because we are one of the most populous regions in North America. We've got a lot of people crammed in here. So the fact that we uh, shared this landscape with so many plants is really quite impressive. We do have 10 species that we know of that are found nowhere else except New England. So 10 endemic species. Um, 
one of which is, is illustrated by this uh, Robin Sinkfoil, Potentilla robinsiana, uh, a, a denizen of the um, White Mountains of New Hampshire, um, and found only there. Um, three of our endemic taxa are now extinct. Um, a hawthorn, a milk vetch, and wait for it, a crabgrass. <laughs> no, nobody's sad to lose a crabgrass. I personally really miss that plant. That actually has disappeared reasonably recently. Um, however, some good news um, as part of some efforts by New England Wildflower Society in partnership with uh, the Appalachian Mountain Club, the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service, and others, uh, we were actually able to successfully remove this endangered plant, Potentilla robensiana, from the U.S. National Endangered Species List. It is the only plant to date that has been delisted. Yay! And it's so, it's so cute. It's such a pretty little plant. Anyway, sorry. <clears throat> the crabgrass is pretty too. I just need to say that. Um, <clears throat> Um, an important thing to realize is that you know, the report focuses on New England, but this is not just about New England, right? You need to look beyond the borders of New England to understand the distributions of these rare plants throughout their whole North American range. And I've chosen here as a poster child the uh, purple milkweed, um, Asclepius purpurescens, um, to, to sort of bring your attention to the fact that, yes, it is highly endangered in um, uh, New England. Um, it has actually disappeared, we think, from New Hampshire. Um, but it is also uh, uh, regarded as imperiled. The more orange and the more red um, a state is colored, the, the worse shape it's in. Um, these brown states have not actually necessarily been evaluated yet. This is a species that is quite rare throughout its range. Um, and on average, when I looked at the North American range of all of the, these rare species in the flora conservanda, on average, they're rare in about 38% um, or a little over 38% of their whole range. So they're not doing particularly well in New England, and they're not doing well outside of New England. So, so some stats. I mean, I have to throw up one or two wonky slides uh, with numbers on it, um, just to give me street cred here. Um, we, have, we considered in the Flora Conservanda in 2012 nearly 600 species, 593 species of, of rare plants. Uh, 62 of which are, are globally rare. Uh, we have hundreds that are regionally rare. And I do want to call your attention really to the number that have actually disappeared from New England. We have nearly 100 species that were here that no longer are. Now they may be holding on outside of New England, but these are species we've lost from our flora. And we don't really even, we haven't even had a chance to understand what their role was in our flora and what their role was for other organisms that may have been dependent on them. We don't want to lose any more. So overall, about 22% um, of the native flora um, is, is listed in the Flora Conservanda 2012. And for those of you who are trolling for uh, PhD projects, um, there are about 53 species which we have to sort of classify division indeterminate. That means we don't know enough about them you know, about either necessarily their distribution or perhaps their taxonomy needs to be worked out. There are things to be discovered um, about these species. So um, now being able to compare the 2012 flora conservanda to the data from 1996 reveals some interesting trends. So just summarizing um, across the globally regionally rare um, and also what we call the division three, uh, declining or disjunct species and the historical species. Um, there, there were certain species that were new to the list in 2012, about 137 of them. There were a number of species that were actually removed from that list, and I'll talk about that in just a minute. Um, but in terms of looking at whether certain species are getting rarer or more, uh, less rare, um, we, we have some reasonably good news. Um, you know, for the most part, the majority of species kind of stayed the same um, in terms of their overall rank. Um, but we had a number that were able to be downlisted. We either discovered new populations uh, or uh, some, some taxonomic issues were resolved, so we felt more confident that they're actually more common than we thought they were. Um, but there are some that, that have actually been uplisted and some that are now regarded as historic. So um, that doesn't necessarily mean that they were extirpated in New England in that 15-year period. 
but it does mean that, that we now are, are pretty confident in being able to say that they're no longer here. Um, a lot of that information, you know, does come from plant conservation volunteers and NEPCOP task force members who actually go out and discover new populations. I, I'm shouting out here 87-year-old uh, Dr. Walter Thayer from uh, Rhode Island, who is a plant conservation volunteer par excellence. Um, has bicycled all over Rhode Island looking for this wonderful plant, uh, Circium horridulum. What a great species name for a plant. I mean, swamp lousewort, Circium horridulum. I mean, honestly, um, if we change the names of half of these plants, we might actually do better with them. Um, and he's discovered several new populations um, of this of the star thistle. So it's it's remarkable what we can learn um, through the activities of, of volunteers like him. Um, so when we delist the flora from the flora conservanda, you know, we have some new finds, um, which may or may not necessarily indicate that the plant is becoming more common or, or coming into New England or proliferating all over New England. We have to be very careful about how we interpret that. Um, some taxonomic revisions. There may be some, uh, we, we did decide to, to not deal with hybrids, hybrid taxa. They're, they're very tricky um, and need more uh, information on them. Um, new information about some species that we used to think were native and rare and maybe are not now. Um, we, don't, we don't necessarily think of them as, as native. They were potentially introduced. And then, of course, you certainly have your actual increases. What else does the report tell us? Well, we, have, we know that there are a number of plant families that are disproportionately uh, declining. So, um, and, and really, we're seeing, uh, when we look at the, the rarity status across all of the species in these families, we notice some pretty disturbing trends. Um, about 60% of the moonworts, who knows moonworts? Yeah, this crowd probably does, yeah, right. Actually, moonworts are so cool, they weren't really wonderful. 60% um, of the, our species in New England are listed as rare. Um, and that's, that's the majority. Um, saxifrages, uh, almost half of our saxifrage species um, are, have some flora conservanda listing. Um, members of the orobancaceae, which are uh, hemiparasitic uh, plants uh, that form very complex relationships with other host plants. Uh, this is Furbish's lousewort, very famous plant, iconic um, in the New England landscape and also the whole field of conservation biology. Um, and orchids we really call attention to the fact that you know over a third of all the species of orchids in uh, New England do are rare, and many more appear to be declining. We're noticing this increasingly um, on the landscape. What are some other kinds of um, <clears throat> commonalities that declining species seem to share? So when we looked at uh, the, the 2012 Flora Conservanda and compared it to the 1996 Flora Conservanda, we came up with a list of species that we can really certifiably say are declining. We, that we, they, there are fewer populations on the landscape. We're, uh, we're concerned about these species. Then you can classify those species based on things like their geographic range uh, relative to New England. Where is the real heart of their range? Are they just sort of uh, reaching a a range margin in New England. Um, and it, and it, when you compare the percentage of species that are actually declining with the percentage of species that either appear to be sort of holding their own, or at least we, we are pretty confident that they're not declining between 1996 and 2012, southern species, species that are reaching sort of the northern uh, range boundary in New England that are hailing from farther south, uh, appear to have a higher proportion of them actually declining. Now that may be a little counterintuitive because we think about climate change a fair amount and we will be discussing that further. Um, and, and so we might expect that northern species are suddenly being sort of forced out of New England or maybe uh, more vulnerable to decline as the temperature warms. But if you consider that many of the southern species are coming in or, or trying to hold their own in, in the very populous states of you know, southern Connecticut, um, southern, southern Rhode Island, you know, um, and, and sort of southern Massachusetts, um, these, these are the, the species that are under heavy, heavy pressure um, from, from human activity. So, um, and it actually accords with, with a previous study that we published in 2007. 
um, that showed a very similar trend. Um, another trend that really popped out to us was uh, that a higher proportion of declining species, nearly 80%, are insect pollinated. They depend on, on insects for their pollination mechanisms. And we compare that with species, a higher proportion of species that are holding their own are, are wind or self-pollinated. So that's a pretty stark contrast. Um, and it, it calls attention to the fact that plants are very dependent on pollinators and vice versa. Now, nobody in this room needs to really have that uh, reinforced. But there's been so much media attention paid to issues such as colony collapse disorder or the decline of monarch butterflies. We're all supposed to go out and plant milkweeds. Um, and without really considering the fact that, well, rare plants are becoming rarer because they are dependent on these insects. And conversely, insects are dependent on plants. So as these rare plants become more rare on the landscape, their insect pollinators can't find them. Um, and so it, it, it's, it's a cyclical kind of process, and a pretty clear signal. Um, the habit, in terms of the habitat affinities, the, the percent of the declining species, the largest uh, proportion of, of declining species um, are found in, in open habitats. So think places like sand plain grasslands, uh, meadows, uh, areas like that, um, shorelines of, of rivers and streams and, and pond shores, uh, rocky habitats, uh, even they're holding on in, in some you know, man-made habitats. So this sort of shows some of the, the trends. Um, you have uh, actually not too many alpine species um, seriously declining, although we do, we'll consider that habitat in a moment. So what are some of the hot spots in New England? Um, what this map shows are the town boundaries across the six New England states. And the more darkly uh, a town is, is colored, uh, the more reports of rare plant species it has. So we can note some hot spots. And I just want to say that you know, just because a town is white, and I know you're all peering at it saying, what do I look? What do you mean there are no rare plants there? Um, you know, this, this was actually compiled uh, a number of years ago for 71 rare plant species, right? So there, there are more occurrences than I'm showing here. But some of these patterns that really pop out, um, as we might expect, a lot of rare plants clustered on Cape Cod and the islands, uh, the White Mountains, of course, um, the Connecticut River Valley, um, because of very rich soils, and the marble belt of western Massachusetts, Connecticut, and Vermont. Plants just dig calcium. That's a bad pun. Um, but they really do. They, they, we have real, real hot spots um, in the Berkshires um, and that area. Um, also, the St. John's River Valley, which has a fair calcareous influence as well. So we can begin to see where these plants are distributed. And if we look at sort of a heat map, um, although this is sort of a reverse heat map um, of the overall distribution of rare plants, this is basically a gradient map. Imagine sort of superimpose a map of New England in your mind on top of this uh, colorful map. When we look at historical distributions of plants, so historical data that we have on uh, historical populations from herbarium sheets, et cetera, what we see are where the, these bluer and greener areas were hot spots. And imagine this being sort of the, the Marble Valley here and Cape Cod over here and northern Maine over here. And what we notice in the present day is uh, the extent of these hotspots is smaller, and they're also much more fragmented. Right? They're all they're sort of vast seas uh, between that separate these rare plant hotspots. So this report um, would have taken me 17 years to write, and I wish it had. You know, it was great. It was second only to my dissertation in terms of pulling together all this information. Um, if I had to bore you with information on every single plant species in New England, all 3,514 of them, you too would be sitting here for the next 17 years. So what we decided to do was to take a habitat-based approach. We um, looked at five predominant habitats, literally stretching from the mountains to the sea in New England, so our alpine zones all the way down to our coastal marshes. These habitats are broadly representative um, of important natural community types in New England. And, you know, we ha habitat is sort of the broad um, uh, umbrella um, that actually uh, contains uh, information on specific natural community types. These are, you know, sort of technical uh, terms for the various assemblages of plants that form rather predictably in different 
places. So uh, we looked at, at these five broad habitats. We um, captured, by doing that, 213 of the, of the uh, Flora conservanda species. Um, and many, we looked at, at the common plant species that dominate in these particular habitats. We looked at the animals uh, that are supported. We didn't just want to be plantocentric, so it was nice to be able to sort of point out it's not just about the plants, it's about all the things that they do and all of the services that they provide to us um, as humans. And then we assessed uh, the primary threats to each of these habitats. Um, and, and through that, we're able to sort of identify what appear to be the habitats that are most under pressure, um, both from current threats um, and also worsening climate change. And most importantly, we wanted to talk about steps that are underway and, and being undertaken by a number of conservation organizations, uh, volunteer organizations, land trusts, et cetera. There's a lot of activity going on um, in New England and additional steps we need to take. So a brief review um, of some of these habitats, uh, alpine, you know, so we are at the, the top here of Mount Mansfield, um, and have some sort of representative uh, rare plants, GM pecii, which um, is, is found only here, or actually only in the White Mountains, um, and, has, and, and various other locations, has a very restricted distribution. They've got 48 rare species, four of which are actually globally rare um, in that in that habitat. So we consider the alpine zone heavily scoured um, by winter weather um, and the subalpine zone uh, where you get a fair amount of um, you know, arctic tundra, a lot of um, cold, cold loving species um, hanging on. Um, one of the more charismatic, uh, if small, uh, members of the animal community supported by these plants is the endemic uh, white mountain fritillary, found only in the white mountains, a very pretty little butterfly. Um, we have several rare bird species, American pipit and Vic Nels thrush. Um, we've got lemmings and martins, and in certain, certain places, the elusive lynx, um, and many, many other animals that sort of make forays into the alpine and subalpine from below. So among the threats, of course, one of the primary threats that we consider is climate change. Uh, this is a very interesting um, model from, uh, put together by Manomet looking at uh, projections of the extent of alpine um, in the presidential range. Um, and what you see here is uh, under a higher emissions scenario or uh, a, an increase of five degrees Fahrenheit, which is by no means out of the question, uh, predicted by climate models, um, alpine habitats may shrink um, in, in area and also be quite a bit more isolated from each other relative to their current extent. So it's a, a reasonably dramatic uh, prediction. We certainly hope it does not come true. Um, we have a number of other stressors. You have some large scale disturbances that have happened. You have the Cog Railway going up on Mount Washington. And we do find that when these disturbances happen, the alpine zones are very slow to recover. So you get a loss of vascular plants. Some of the bryophytes, you know, mosses uh, and lichens may come back. Um, over a 20 year period, but many of the herbaceous plants are, are much slower to come back. Um, I talked a little bit um, about uh, the recovery of the robin sink foil. Uh, one of the pressures that was impinging on that plant was trampling. Uh, a hiking trail went right through the population. So it's not rocket science. You move the hiking trail, that's good, um, and, and, and that population has recovered. With climate change, we're also a bit concerned that we'll get more encroachment of trees and shrubs. Um, and so we're, we're, um, and we're also beginning to see a bit of that in the Adirondacks and also the White Mountains. So what are some of the management needs? I mean, some of what we can do in the Alpine really um, is to watch very carefully what is happening. Um, uh, because and, and fundamentally, we need to reduce our greenhouse gas emissions. We want to slow climate change down. It is already underway, um, but we can begin to slow it and reverse it um, if we take concerted action to reduce our, our carbon footprint. And, and we are doing some uh, of that regionally um, with a lack of national political will to move on this. Individual states are really trying to look hard uh, at how we can reduce our carbon footprint. Um, 
permanent transects, permanent plots have been very useful for documenting things like the encroachment of shrubs and the disappearance of alpine species. Collecting and banking seeds as a stopgap measure um, for potentially restoring these communities um, will be uh, important, and we are doing some of that um, at New England Wildflower Society. We will be doing more in the coming years. Uh, move the trails and restrict the amount of disturbance um, that you're uh, impinging on this habitat. So mixed northern hardwood forests, we're going to hear a lot more, I think, from David Foster about the importance of forests in New England. This is sort of the iconic or emblematic forest of our region. You know, think of the exploding colors in the fall, and the sap is running in the maples right now. Um, it, is, it is what we think of, I think, when we think of New England. It also contains intact, rich examples of this forest type, contain a, a wealth of herbaceous species, a lot of native orchids, uh, Hydrasis canadensis, golden seal, uh, has uh, important medicinal qualities, uh, and 48 rare species, five of which are globally rare. And it's a very, very extensive um, habitat type. So in terms of the animals that it supports, because it is so large, it's a very large matrix forest, um, it tends to support big mammals like bears and moose and things that have larger uh, home ranges, and very importantly, a whole host of forest interior nesting birds. So these are migratory warblers. You've got your scarlet tanager, which glows in the dark. Um, you, you've got a number of other species that really need large stretches of forests, even though they're tiny little birds, uh, to find a happy nesting habitat. Um, and you know, there there are embedded in these forests fernal pools and. Um, beaver meadows, and all sorts of other uh, wetland habitats. So you tend to find rare salamanders, um, and yet another uh, quite rare butterfly, the early hair street, among others. Two things that we notice that are major stressors on our forest ecosystems, and any of you who have had a deer wander into your backyard and munch on all of your orchids um, will find this familiar. Um, deer are having uh, major impacts, particularly on the herbaceous uh, flora of the forest understory. Um, exposure experiments, such as these that take place at the Harvard Forest and elsewhere, um, really demonstrate dramatically what happens. Here's where the deer aren't. Here's where the deer are. Kind of a picture worth a thousand words. Um, again, climate change is, is of concern. Um, it, we know what it's going, it, it is already causing some rearrangements of the flora. Uh, we're also seeing uh, dramatic uh, acceleration of flowering uh, during spring warmings. Uh, for certain species, there are certain species that will be winners, certain species that will be losers. Um, current distribution of plants, this red area um, is uh, rich sugar maple, beech, uh, birch forest. Um, under a lower emission scenario, it may uh, migrate a bit north, but it will hang on uh, to the majority of its range. Under a higher emission scenario, it could be restricted to basically northern Maine. Um, so that, you'll see some dramatic rearrangements um, of species under these different climate uh, below models. So what do we need? What do we need to do? And we're already doing some of this. There are concerted uh, regional efforts to protect large forests and to encourage landowners to manage them sustainably and cooperatively so that we're not necessarily just making little tiny patch cuts and creating a very fragmented habitat. Um, so we really want to encourage sustainable forestry and conservation of large corridors. Um, obviously, our forests are being uh, threatened by invasive insects. We've already seen hemlock woolly adelgid uh, wreaking havoc on our hemlocks. Uh, the emerald ash borer is at our doorstep um, and, and becoming more common in, in the region. Um, we got to figure out what to do with the deer. Um, we just have to. <laughs> there's, there's, a, there's a number of options out there, um, but, but we really uh, we, we need to uh, either either begin to call or, or at least figure out ways to reduce the fecundity of deer. Um, there are a host of invasive plant species, like um, honeysuckle species, uh, Lanicera, um, Japanese barberry, Celastris, and oriental bittersweet that do come into forests. And there are some that, again, are sort of lurking off stage um, or just beginning to show up in our area. Kudzu, among them strikes fear into the hearts of men. <laughs> you know? um, but we can manage these things if we detect them early. And that's why voluntary efforts like the Invasive Plant Atlas of New England, or, or which has now been folded into EdMaps, for early detection, early reporting, uh, there's an app for that, um, help 
help actually you know, manage these things early on, so before they get established. And for certain sensitive species like um, ginseng and like dwarf, dwarf ginseng and like golden seal that are slow growing and may, may be over harvested in certain areas, we actually don't know enough um, about the harvesting dynamics of those species. And also things like orchid species that have tremendously complex life histories. Um, we're going to have to come up with ways to uh, actively restore them. So river habitats, uh, we considered, you know, obviously some of our largest rivers, the Connecticut River um, a, uh, and, and its tributaries, but we have a number of important rivers that course through New England and smaller streams, um, et cetera. So we considered, you know, the floodplain forests, some of the ephemeral communities that occur on sandbars and also um, rocky outcrops, et cetera. Um, the uh, Robbins um, Jessup's milk vetch, uh, again endemic to New England, known from only three populations on the Connecticut River. That's it. It disappears. It's gone, um, period. A lot of uh, very intensive conservation work um, happening to restore that. Um, who's, who do we find um, in riparian forests? Well, you know, obviously very charismatic wading birds. Um, it's estimated, at least for Maine, that 85% of all vertebrate species, and that's from you know frogs to bears, um, spend some portion of their time um, foraging in riparian habitats. Um, we've got rare cobblestone tiger beetles um, and, and other tiger beetle species. Um, actually, there's a there's a, a song for Plainfield, New Hampshire, about the tiger beetle, but I'm not going to sing it for you right now. I'll spare you that. Um, you know, dragonflies and damselflies, rare mussels. Mussels are some of the most endangered species throughout the globe. Turtles, eagles, it just goes on. Um, but look at the um, number of dams. It's all of these dots are the numbers of dams uh, along the Connecticut River. We've got 10,250 uh, river dams throughout New England. Um, and uh, we, we actually, New England leads the way in dam removal. Um, we've taken out 100 of them. Awesome. <laughs> Um, <clears throat> but we also attempt to control our rivers. We riprap them, we channelize them, we make them, uh, you know, straighten them. Uh, in in the advent of uh, in the aftermath of Hurricane Irene, we did uh, try to restore the sort of you know orderly um, uh, flow of, of rivers, but inadvertently can also by that manipulation increase the risk of flooding later. Pollution and dumping. We also have invasive plant species coming in there. So what are some of the management needs? It would probably be nice to remove at least some of the dams. Um, you know, dams do provide a useful service. They provide hydro energy. They do um, offer some flood control. But probably we don't need all 10,250 of them. So if we can make some uh, smart decisions about which dams we need and which dams uh, actually pose a threat, that would be helpful. Um, Floodplains have been heavily developed um, and also heavily polluted, and we need to, to restore them. There are some activities underway, some experimental work by the, the trustees of reservations to actually restore floodplain forests, which is very exciting. Um, clean up polluted waterways, and we've actually done a pretty good job of that. It used to be the Connecticut River would run red and purple and green, depending on what uh, factory was discharging what chemicals and what day. And now it's class B. Um, that's pretty heartening. We can do the same for our other waterways. Um, and obviously, I mentioned Jessup's milk vetch. You know, there are some very rare plant species that we need to restore. Now turning to a drier habitat, sand plain, grasslands, and heathlands. Uh, put yourselves on this, on this rainy day on Cape Cod where you have real hot spots. We also have interior sand plains. So the Montague sand plains, the Shapely Waterboro Barrens in Maine. Um, contain a, a wealth of, of plant species that are highly adapted to these very dry xeric environments. It, it turns out many of the sand plains that we highly value may, may be the long-term uh, uh, product of, of agricultural activities, early colonial activities, burning uh, and clearing of large swaths of land uh, for agriculture created interestingly the sort of uh, soil conditions that then when they were abandoned, uh, these uh, uh, all of these interesting plant species could take over. One globally rare one is, is Agalinus acuta. See, the bee? It's a bee. <laughs> it's a butterfly. 
Um, we have some very tight relationships, just incredible insect diversity in sand plain, grasslands, and heathlands. Hundreds of species here. And I know many people may think that bugs, why do we care about bugs, really? Um, but you know, consider the federally endangered Carner blue butterfly, which relies on wild lupin, which is a, 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 a very important plant in uh, indicator plant in, in sand plains. Um, so there are, there are some very very tight pollinator relationships. Um, but think of grassland songbirds, um, savanna sparrows, etc. Uh, raptors, our New England cottontail. I mentioned bunnies earlier, didn't I? Um, black racer, large snakes, um, box turtle, Fowler's toad. A lot of very interesting species. But some of the threats to our sand plains, this one's being taken over by multiflora rose um, and also rosa mucosa. Um, we have all, so invasive plant species are of concern. Um, also, we've converted huge percentages of the sand plains, both interior sand plains and coastal sand plains, um, or these grasslands, um, for urban uses, for airports. Uh, for military bases. Actually, the U.S. military is working very hard to restore a lot of these habitats. It's very interesting to see. Um, maybe 60% of, of these kinds of habitats have actually been converted. And you can imagine why. They perk. And they're mostly kind of flat. So it's easy to develop them. One other important uh, consideration is that you know fire is what probably helped a lot of these uh, establish. Um, and, and it was further reinforced by grazing. Uh, Etc. Now we lack these disturbances. So a lot of these uh, habitats are, are reverting to pitch pine forests and oak forests. So we're losing some of that herbaceous diversity. So what we need to do is to try and figure out, you know, we want to protect, you know, the, the really fine remaining examples. Um, it's also possible to identify potential new habitats. Some interesting studies have come out looking at sort of aerial photographs and pinpointing good places that might actually be available for restoration to sand plain, uh, grasslands, and heathlands. Uh, we need to figure out how to manage wisely. I mean, fire can be used in certain circumstances, maybe mowing, maybe grazing. These are all sorts of, of experiments that we need to, to conduct. And there's been some very good work done. Um, so for all of these management needs in whatever habitat you're, you're looking at, you need to monitor and publicize your, your outcomes. You really need to, to, to get the word out and collaborate among organizations and do some work to at least remove or reduce invasive species. Now, finally, and I'm doing OK on time? Great. Um, we come to the shore. Um, we come to the coastline. And I know most of us would rather be on the beach, um, but I'm going to take us deep into the muck of our estuary marshes, our brackish and salt marshes, um, which it turns out are really among the most imperiled um, habitat types in New England. Um, and various analyses, the state of New Hampshire just completed a new, an analysis that really um, identified so, salt marshes as, as very, very at risk. Now, what are they at risk from? We'll talk about that in just a second. But they do consist of highly specialized plants. You know, these plants put up with, you know, here's, here's uh, salt marsh cordgrass and, and uh, also Spartina patens. Um, they, are, they have adaptations that enable them to withstand daily tides, uh, hypersaline conditions, um, you know, disturbance conditions that create openings in the marsh. The marsh is a, an amazing dynamic mosaic of habitats. We look out and we see a big salt marsh. There's an awful lot going on in there. Um, so we, um, and, and they're, they're quite complex to restore. So we, glossy ibis, I know those of you with, with excitement about birds. Um, but also consider the fish we eat and the shellfish we eat. 75% of the commercially important species, Atlantic salmon, shad, uh, flounder, uh, bluefish, um, spend some form, some, some part of their life in and around the creeks of salt marshes. They find shelter there as juveniles, uh, et cetera. We also have shellfish. Anybody from Rhode Island, you like your quahogs, right? You know, you're, you're, salt, you're out, out in the flats here. Um, Northern Harriers, you know, Osprey, all of these hunting raptors uh, that frequent the, the coast, um, and, and even the meadow vole. But what have we done to our salt marshes? Well, <laughs> we, we, we um, dig channels through them. We, we've ditched them because of those pesky mosquitoes that we wanted to get rid of. We wanted to ditch and drain our salt marshes because there's these stagnant, standing, awful wastelands. Um, unfortunately, the ditches tend to hold a lot of standing water which mosquitoes really like. 
that didn't really work terribly well. Um, so we've really kind of converted them. We've, we've altered the tidal flow. We've you know, forced the tides through little culverts here. Um, but we also have a very, uh, we, we load them with nutrients from upland developments, you know, nutrients, also herbicides and pesticides that we put on our perfectly manicured lawns. Um, but a very complex phenomenon known as marsh dieback, which is currently affecting 80% of the marshes on Cape Cod um, and 50 or 60, between 50 and 60% of the marshes, salt marshes on, in Rhode Island are affected. And marsh dieback is an extremely interesting ecological phenomenon. A lot of this work comes out of Mark Berkness's lab at Brown University. Um, the fish that I mentioned before are natural predators on the crabs that like to hang out in salt marshes. Crabs are very common in salt marshes. And um, these fish would keep, normally keep crab populations in check. Well, it turns out crab populations are exploding in salt marshes. And that is because with recreational and commercial fishing, we are depleting the populations of these predatory fish. When crab populations explode, there's nothing they love better than to chomp on salt marsh cordgrass, Spartina alterniflora. Spartina alterniflora is literally the plant that is holding together the salt marsh. So when they kill the plants and they disrupt their roots by their burrows, etc., you begin to lose the holding capacity. You combine that with sea level rise, and you get a salt marsh that is heavily, heavily impacted and at risk of basically eroding into the sea. So we, this is a great example of how you actually need to step back and consider the food web further um, and the complex ecology of these systems. And it can take years to kind of tease out some of these um, complex interactions. But it's clear we need to sort of talk to people about uh, controlling it recreational fishing, how to restore our fish stocks. Um, and, and there are some techniques for restoring marshes, for being able to replant them and stabilize them, especially when we do things like remove uh, invasive uh, reed, common reed, Phragmites, Australis. Um, we want to reduce nutrient loading because nutrients flowing into the salt marshes tend to encourage the growth of invasive common reed um, and some other invasive species. And obviously, we've got to slow sea level rise. OK, there's going to be a quiz on this later, so I hope you're getting this all down. Um, this is our recommendations, um, and, and we'll be quick about this. We really need to know more um, about our existing flora. And there are a million PhD dissertations out there. So for any of you who are looking to retire from your current career and go back to graduate school, talk to me. Um, and here are just some of the, of the questions we have for hundreds of, of plant species that would help us understand more fundamentally what we need to do to conserve them. And I just want to put a, make a shout out. I mean, I've been talking about vascular plants, you know, plants with vessels and things, but there are all these mosses and bryophytes and lichens out there that really deserve more of our attention. Mosses are, are, are foundation species for uh, bogs and many other wetland types. Um, and these are, you know, uh, sequestering carbon and doing all the same things that other plants are doing. Um, so we need much more information on them because they tend to really escape our notice. Um, obviously, we need to conserve land. We need to conserve plants. Um, following on the recommendations of, of the global strategy for plant conservation, the idea would be to protect at least 75% um, of the plant species by collecting seed um, and, and at least preserving their seed. But most important is, you know, you can protect land. You can, you can put it away in a nice conservation preserve, um, but you need to manage that land. You can't just you know, lock the gate on it and say, OK, we protected that. Next, um, man management takes time. It takes blood, sweat, tears, and money, just not to put too fine a point on it. Um, we also want to do uh, look at production lands and the habitat value of agricultural lands and for working forests and be sure that we're managing those sustainably because they do harbor their own biodiversity. And we may actually be able to use agriculture more intense, intelligently to provide habitats for some of these creatures that depend on open areas. And obviously, we want to detect uh, biological invasions quite early. Uh, there are apps for that, et cetera. We really need to educate the next generation. Um, and we, botanic gardens are stepping into the void. Uh, we don't tend to have, uh, have a lot of plant education in our schools, in our colleges. Botany curricula are being dropped. 
uh, nobody looks at a whole plant anymore. They just grind up into genes, right? It's too complicated to get out and look at real plants. So, you know, GoBotany, a lot of these other uh, programs are designed to entice the next generation to become fascinated with plants through their obsession with technology. But more importantly, get outside with your kids, teach them, get them noticing their plants. They don't have to know all the names. You don't have to know all the names. Just get them looking at it. Um, and there's no real financial reason for a plant to go extinct. Okay, we need funding. Um, what you don't necessarily need a heck of a lot of funding for the cost it takes to downlist one animal species, you can actually protect nine plant species. So um, it, you can cost effectively, and, and in so doing, you protect the animal species that depend upon them um, in, in a whole sort of natural community. So um, right now, um, it is estimated that the total cost needed to protect global biodiversity is a tiny fraction of our annual GDP. So not suggesting that we pay for the whole thing, but just pointing out. Um, so what you can do, plant native plants. If every single person in this audience planted one native plant in their yard, we'd have a major restoration project for birds, okay? All across New England. Um, it's as simple as that now. Um, and, and it's easy, they grow better here, right? They, they evolved here. It's, it, it actually makes some pretty wonderful parts of your garden. Reduce the amount of pesticides and herbicides you're putting on that perfect lawn. Uh, not only are they poisonous to you and your kids and your pets, they flow downstream and pollute our waterways. Um, educate yourself, get out, uh, appreciate plants, remove invasives when they show up in your yard, uh, prevent new ones and plant, plants that will, will uh, outcompete them, and support your local conservation organization. At the community level, and we're already starting to do this, you can work with municipal officials to educate them about the importance of plants. They are making very important decisions. The Department of Transportation, DPW, um, are making very important large-scale landscape decisions about what to plant along our highways and uh, you know, in our towns. Um, advocate for more education in schools. Um, you, know, you want to encourage your local stores to, to um, support plants. And again, support policies for sustainable agriculture. At the national level, we just have to turn governments around. <laughs> There's no better way to put it. Climate change is real. We need to stop the discussion. <laughs> we need to, to realistically prevent carbon emissions and greatly reduce them. Um, we need more funding at the national level for land protection and land management. Um, and strengthening laws that prevent unwise development is very important. So, what we want to do in the end is to create and foster functioning ecosystems with species, all species, plants and everybody else, continuing to evolve in response to evolutionary pressures, all these threats, with as little intervention or input as possible. So with these overall strategies, um, this, is the, this is some of the, the things that we do. And we're already doing them. We know what to do. We uh, have been successful with many of these strategies, and we, we just need to move forward. So I hope everybody in this room gets out, plants a plant, and appreciates all the good activity that is actually going on. It's not gloom and doom. We can make this happen. So with that, I acknowledge um, the people who have helped with this report, the peer reviewers, uh, the funders, and I'm happy to take questions if we have time.